title is what, please? U.S. District Judge. U.S. District Judge. Southern District of New York. Southern District of New York. Judge, you were born where? Uh, well, I was born in the city, but I've you were? actually been a lifelong resident of Westchester County. You were, really? Yes. Yeah, that's nice. You went to school here? I did. Uh-huh. And uh, also attended New York Military Academy. Oh, you did? Is that a good background for almost anything? I would uh, think so. Really? Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Very good. You might bear that in mind, boys and girls, that that would be a good background. And then you went off to college? Went to Providence College. Yes. And then to uh, Albany Law School. Albany Law School. And then uh, after you passed your bar and everything, uh, where did you, uh, what was your first assignment, or were you a... <clears throat> I practiced in the city with a large firm for a very oh, short period. Yes. And <laughs> then uh, left and came back to Westchester County and spent uh, my entire professional life in, uh, in Westchester County in the Ninth Judicial District, some of that time in the state court. And last uh, June, um, I went into the federal court in, in Manhattan again. Yes, but it, it was such an interesting progression. Now, what was the first one? The, uh, the first court? First court, yes. Well, after 12 years of practicing law, yes. I went to uh, the family court. The family court in S Westchester County? In Westchester County. I see. Served there for uh, three years. Yes. And then went on to the Westchester County Court. Westchester County Court. That's uh, a court that tries uh, criminal cases primarily. Yes. Spent uh, four years in the county court. In the county court. And then was elected to the uh, New York State Supreme Court. Oh. And I served there for approximately seven years. What an interesting career. Well, it's been a lot of fun. Now, that's the New York uh, Supreme Court, but that would be in Westchester County. Ninth Judicial District, which includes Westchester County. Oh, uh, includes it. Rockland, Orange, Duchess, Ooh. Putnam, and uh, I guess I included them all. I think The five so. counties. Yeah, Rockland, Orange, Orange Putnam. Putnam West Duchess, Dutch, Westchester, and Duchess. and Duchess. Boy, that's a big district, isn't it? Well, it was a lot of fun traveling around <laughs> the different <laughs> yeah. courthouses. You enjoyed that, yeah? I did. I did. enjoyed it very much. You, you felt somewhat analogous to um, Abe Lincoln when he was a circuit <laughs> yeah, rider. when he was a circuit rider, right. And then you were appointed. Well, then I received a telephone call from the president. Uh, it happened to be on my mother's birthday. Really? And uh, he told me that he was going to nominate me uh, to the... Um, uh, to the federal bench, the district court, Ooh. and uh, by coincidence, my mother was present in my chambers when I received the call, and uh, he asked Ooh. to speak with her and wished her a happy birthday. Did I thought that really? was really nice. R President Ronald Reagan? Yes, yes, he did. Isn't that And she thrill. instantly became a hit with the senior citizens in Pelham, <laughs> where she lives. <laughs> I bet she did, she right? She did. Oh, isn't that a thrill? So there yeah. you were, and here came a call from the president. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a yeah. big thrill. And your mom was a big hit with him, huh? That's correct. Yeah. Now, when's your mom's birthday? When was that? Well, it was on January 18th, uh, and uh, it, it was a year ago yeah. this past January. Oh, I bet she was thrilled. She was. I she bet was she was indeed. thrilled. Well, you know, my mom met Ronald Reagan. Did she? Yes, she did, Where? really. In Buffalo, New York. He came there, uh, boys and girls, to run for president to get the Republican nomination, and it was the first time... It was. How did that go now? He ran for it, and then who won? Uh, Ford. Well, that was the nomination, I think. Yeah. This was that in was the primaries. It was, you're, you're it was that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and then Ford got it, and then he came back again. Yeah. Oh, it's a thrill to meet the president, I tell you. Uh, Judge Duranco, could you tell the boys and girls um, what your work consists of in the Southern District? Well, uh, my work consists of meeting with lawyers and uh, attempting to yes. resolve uh, conflicts between uh, litigants, yes. uh, hearing cases, uh, helping to select uh, juries and uh, charging the jury with re as to the law that applies in a given case, and in a, in a real sense, uh, trying to resolve grievances between people. Yes, yeah. And that's I bet it, it makes you feel good when you get them resolved. It does. Yeah. It does. Great satisfaction. When Judge Duranco comes back, boys and girls, he's going to tell you how you might start on a legal career today. And this is a chat with Glendora. <laughs> Judge Duranco, what advice would you give a youngster to start out to be a lawyer today? Well, I would advise any youngster who uh, thought that he or she might want to uh, enter the legal profession to spend some time either with an attorney or uh, go over to a, the courthouse and watch some trials. Oh. 
I think that might at least familiarize you, familiarize you with what uh, the practice of law may be like. That's a good idea. And, uh, of course, uh, a, a preparation, an academic preparation for any profession is important. And uh, in the law profession, particularly, one should uh, uh, like to read and, and uh, be able to write fairly well. Oh, really? Yes, I would think so. You've got to practice those skills. Yeah. And anybody can go into the courthouse and watch? Oh, sure. It's oh, open to the public. It is. Uh, yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah. And then if you aspire to uh, be on the bench as a judge, what, what, how would you go about that? Well, of course, uh, if we work backwards, one must be an attorney to be a judge. So you have to have a, a law degree. And uh, prior to obtaining a law degree, one needs a college education. And prior to that, a good high school good education. High school, yeah. Studying is very important. Um, if you uh, wish to be a judge, I would think that you should attempt to uh, have a great deal of patience, be able to listen to both sides of a controversy, and not jump to a conclusion. Yeah. Uh, be judgmental rather than an advocate, as trial lawyers are expected to be. Um, see the other person's point of view, help to resolve grievances between people, yeah. and enjoy doing that. Yeah. Well, that was nice of you uh, to come up. Did you come up from Manhattan today? Yeah, yeah. I did. It was really nice of you to come and tell us about the president calling you. Well, it was nice uh, to be able to come home a little early because <laughs> I I dropped off, uh, uh, I got off at Pelham and then drove up from there. Oh, you did? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Gee, we appreciate your coming, Judge Dora. My pleasure. Nice to be with you, Glendora. Oh, thank you. And this is a chat with Glendora. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, thank you. That was a big moment in life. Indeed it was. That's <laughs> hard work and a big accomplishment. Oh, indeed, yes. And then next was what, Judge Cowie? Well, after I finished school, I, as I said, I went into the Army for a couple of years. Of course, that was during the Korean War. We did not have much choice in the matter at that time since we were drafted. Although it was a very good experience, I must say, and I would recommend the military or even naval service, Army, Air really? Force, whichever. It is a tremendous force in maturing an individual. It's a great power in developing the personality really? and converting a boy into a man. Really? So I'd strongly urge anyone who is at all interested in the uh, military to have no hesitation whatsoever about joining. And Uncle Sam wants you. Yes, yes, yes. Well, he may want you, but he does have a lot to offer to. There's no doubt about that. So I was in the Army during the Korean War period. And then I came out of the army. Yeah. And the choice then was where to go to settle down. Yeah. Appreciated working with Judge Beinstein. I think the world of that man, and he was a wonderful individual to work with. And of course, the more you tried to do for him, the more he tried to really? encourage me to. Nice. So it yeah. was a most mutually satisfactory uh, working arrangement. Yeah. So I was with him up until the time that I did seek the nomination for Westchester County Court Judge. Oh! So uh, then I worked hard to get that nomination. Did you? Fortunate enough to be one of the nominees. Yes. Uh, there were, uh, of course, for the Supreme Court, you see, it is not limited to Westchester County, it's but it covers Westchester, Putnam, Dutchess County, and then it goes over on the other side of the river, too. Orange and Rock. Right. Many of the, all of these counties are included in this district. So uh, the ninth district. The ninth district, right you are. So when it Judge Cowie, uh, will you please tell the boys and girls what you like best about being a judge? I think one of the greatest things and most enjoyable aspects of being a judge is that you meet so many people, such a great variety of people, and you run into so many experiences as a result of handling all of these cases. I have found that these real-life experiences can be more exciting and more interesting than even the, the best of TV shows or the like of it. Yes, yes. Is, as has often been said, uh, real life can be more interesting yeah. than any uh, th yeah. theater production. Right. And there's a lot of truth to that. Yep. Yeah. Truth is stranger than fiction. We, I, could, I could almost write several books here just on the yeah. basis of the type people that we meet and the cases and the experiences yeah, we run story. into. Uh -huh.
Trick says, because that's all they know. And Sid is really into music, folks. Yeah, there isn't an instrument he can't play. That's how he brags. And his friend says, that's right, he can't play the piano, he can't play the banjo, and he can't play the guitar. And did you hear the uh, headline on the TV news tonight? A freighter uh, carrying a load of yo-yos hit a reef and sunk 113 times. And off the coast of Florida, two ships collided. One ship was carrying a load of red paint. The other ship was carrying a load of purple paint. And at the latest report, both the passengers and crews of both ships were marooned. And Bessie Carter, who is the crossword puzzle addict, she changed a clause in her will. And now when she dies, she wants to be buried six down and three across. And uh, in White Plains, a citizen was hauled into court uh, for not paying his check at a donut shop. And he was charged with impersonating an officer. And this week, the Clairvoyance Club will not meet because of unforeseen circumstances. And in Harrison, a wine truck collided with a cheese truck, resulting in a $3,000 fundraiser. And uh, Tom says that people are so inconsiderate that his last boss thought nothing of telephoning him and waking him out of a sound work day. And uh, Diane says that her husband suffers from insanity. And Diane's mother says he doesn't suffer from it, he enjoys it. And here's a business joke. The company bought a new conference table. It's nine feet wide, it's 30 feet long, and it sleeps 20. And uh, a panhandler said to Arthur, could I please have a dollar for a cup of coffee? And Arthur says, a dollar for a cup of coffee? And the panhandler says, please, just say yes or no. Don't tell me how to run my business. And another panhandler asked the pedestrian, could I have $20 for a cup of coffee? And the woman says, $20 for a cup of coffee? And the panhandler says, well, can I help it if I'm a big tipper? This is Glendora, a cheerful look at life. Let's return now to a chat with Glendora. <laughs> boys and girls. Uh, look who came to see you today. Uh, this is Judge uh, Miriam Cedarbaum. And uh, Judge Cedarbaum, you were born where? Uh, I was born at a hospital in Manhattan, <laughs> but at that time my family was living in Brooklyn and I grew up in Brooklyn. You did? About half a mile from Ebbets Field. You did really? And where did you go to school? I went to a public school in Brooklyn. Yes. And then I went to a public high school, Erasmus Hall High School, which is celebrating its 200th birthday this really? year. Really? Oh, that's great. And then uh, where, where did you go to college after that? Barnard College. Bar uh -huh. And what did you major in? What did you take for courses? I majored in government, but I took the minimum number of courses in my major because I was very interested in a number of other subjects. I, I took a great deal of mathematics. Did you? Uh, I took uh, a lot of foreign language and literature and philosophy. You did, there, just one little thing I want to make clear. That's down at Foley Square, right? Yes, I'm at the United States Courthouse at Foley Square. And one of your other jobs was down at Foley Square. That's right. The first several years after law school, yeah. I was at Foley Square first as a law clerk to a district judge, and then as an assistant United States attorney for the Southern District of New York. So I think that's the way to do it. <laughs> that is well, it's certainly one way. Now, Judge Miriam Cedarbarn, and boys and girls, when she comes back, uh, she will tell you what her work is like to see if you would like to aim for such a career as that. And then uh, she might tell you how to get started on a legal career today, which, of course, is entirely different uh, from the days that she started. And this is Chat with Glendora. Judge Cedarbaum, yes, please tell the boys and girls uh, what your work is like, to see if they'd like that as a career. Well, I am a trial judge in the federal system, which means that I spend a great deal of time in the courtroom presiding over trials. In the federal court, we have a great variety of trials. We have both civil and criminal cases, and we also have uh, cases that arise under federal statutes, secure, for example, securities cases, uh, cases involving copyright and trademark and patent. We also have, which is exclusively federal jurisdiction, admiralty cases, cases involving shipping. Oh. 
and maritime disputes. In addition to what we call federal question cases, the kind of cases that arise under federal statutes, we have all of the kinds of cases that the state civil courts have when a citizen of one state sues the citizen of another state. Because under our Constitution, when the citizenship of the two parties is diverse, a case can be brought in the federal court. And of course, we, for the, in, in those diversity cases, we have all kinds of accident cases, medical malpractice cases, product liability cases, contract disputes of all kinds, the a cross section of the kind of litigation that uh, one finds in state courts. Well, that's everything, isn't it? Just about. It's just about everything, yeah. except that federal criminal matters oh. are more limited than oh. state criminal matters. Uh, federal crimes are defined by federal statute and uh, by and large uh, do not include a lot of the ordinary state crimes. Uh, now that's, uh, there, are, there would never be a dull moment, right? There is never a dull moment right. because of course in addition to the trials that go on much of the time and we have a very heavy volume of the filing of yeah. cases and uh, the numbers uh, of trials. We have other kinds of proceedings uh, that go on at the same time. Yes. Uh, for example, the way in which parties ask the court to make decisions apart from trials of cases is by motion, which is an application to the court for one kind of relief or another. And I must hear and decide a great many motions in addition to the trial. Hi, folks. Let's take a break now for Glendora Cheerful Look at Life. They call it Take Home Pay because you're too embarrassed to take it anywhere else. And John got a note in his pay envelope, and it says your raise will become effective as soon as you do. And Annette has a new coiffure, and it, what it looks like is shredded wheat with hairpins. And Joan says there's one of her plants that she won't talk to at all because this plant thinks that it knows everything. And the plumber came to the door, and he says, where's the drip? And Barbara says, he's upstairs trying to fix the leak. And you know the quickest and fastest way for you to have your family tree traced? You run for political office. And a rookie policeman was asked on an examination, how would you break up a crowd? What's the fastest way to break up a crowd? And the rookie policeman thought just a second, and then he says, i take up a collection. And the candidates are out raising money. Some of the candidates are having $1,000 a plate dinners, and other candidates are just having Tupperware parties. And one candidate has promised, uh, well, he spent $20 million uh, to get his party's nomination. Now, that may sound like a lot of money, but really that comes down to $2 per promise. And another candidate says that he can balance the budget by tilting the country. And Bob says, you really shouldn't make fun of politicians. You shouldn't be too hard on them because, after all, they're doing the work of two men. And the question is, what two men? And the answer is Laurel and Hardy. Folks, millions of Americans don't vote. Now, why is that? Harry says it's because under the Republicans, you can't earn your keep. And under the Democrats, you can't keep what you earn. And Peter says, don't forget now to vote early and vote often. And uh, a little girl asked her mother, Diane, she says, Mommy, do all fairy tales begin with once upon a time? And Diane says, no, dear. Some fairy tales begin with if I'm elected. Folks, do you know why history always repeats itself? Why does history always repeat itself? Because nobody was listening the first time. And Billy says, honesty is the best policy. He says, I know. He says, I've tried them both. And John says that he got a letter from the president asking, telling him that when the appropriate time came, 
uh, the president would use him in an advisory capacity. And John's wife says, well, those weren't exactly the right words. What the president said was, when I want your advice, I'll ask for it. Now, Columbus, Christopher Columbus set out from Spain, right, to find the in India. And he ended up in the Bahamas, and he thought he was in America. So now, if Christopher Columbus were alive today, he'd be working for the post office. Isn't that so? And Ed went into the post office, and he said to the clerk, he says, I want $50 worth of stamps. And the clerk says, what denomination? And Ed says, Baptist. And uh, this one thing that you can say about sales clerks, old sales clerks never die, or if they do, it's hard to tell. Bobby said to his dad, what does COD stand for? And his dad said, crushed on delivery. And the minister said, I've always stated that the poor are welcome in this church. And by the look of today's collection, I see they have arrived. And Sid says, do you have a good preacher? And John says, yes, he's a good preacher. He says, at the end of every service, there's a great awakening. And Andy said to his mother, he said, did you say the preacher's name was Reverend or Never End? And little Paul said to his friend, what is uh, procrastination? And little Johnny says, I don't know. He says, I think that's something that the Presbyterians believe in. This is Glendora, a cheerful look at life. And now let us return to a chat with Glendora. <laughs> well, I enjoy it a lot, and uh, uh, I strongly urge uh, everyone to uh, get involved in a field that, field that they enjoy, because work is really a lot of fun, and uh, <laughs> if, you're, you. if you have fun at it, and the juices are flowing, uh, time passes, and uh, but I, uh, my typical day, I guess, is, uh, is a lot of correspondence and, and uh, some meetings and telephone calls. We're in a growing mode of our company right now. So I spend some time on operations. We do have good operating people in the field that oversee our system's operations, but I have to keep in touch with them. And then I, I'm spending really quite a bit of time searching out for new acquisitions. today. Just miserable, right? Welcome to Glendora, a cheerful look at life. Folks, can you answer this question? What do you call a coffee break at the Lipton Tea Company? And you know what a philosopher is? That's a person who finds out more and more about less and less until finally he knows everything about nothing. And what's the formula for water? It's H2O, right? Now, do you know what the formula is for an ice cube? It's H2O squared. And uh, did you hear about the Olympic Games and the Czechoslovakian uh, trampoline team? They're called the Bouncing Czechs. And John wants to know why uh, living in California is like eating a bowl of granola. Well, the answer is that after you've gone through the nuts and the fruits, there's plenty of flakes left. And did you ever, what do you think about the English language? For instance, do you know that we park in a driveway and we drive on a parkway? And uh, did you ever try to explain counterclockwise to a person who wears a digital watch? If they say that the uh, world is getting smaller, then how come the airline, the price of the airline tickets is getting bigger? And Peter says 
that more people would pay attention to the Electoral College if they had a football team. Folks, there are five billion ballpoint pens manufactured in the United States every year. Can you tell us why there's never one at the telephone when you have to take a message? And if this is such a small world, we'd all like to know, why does it cost so much to run it? Folks, a neurotic is a person who builds castles in the air, a psychotic is a person who lives in castles in the air, and a psychiatrist is a person who collects rent from both of them. Don't you love those great, great big words that psychiatrists use? Uh, for instance, a uh, psychiatrist says, you're suffering from cashew maraschino syndrome. You know what that means? You're nutty as a fruitcake. There is a sign in the uh, restaurant window, and it says blended coffee, and one of the customers asked, uh, what's in the blend? And the waitress says, yesterday's and today's. Now, in a filling station, there was a restaurant in a filling station, and in the restaurant there was a sign that says, eat here and get gas. Uh, Ed says that he has the problem about retirement. He's too uh, old to work, and yet he's too poor to retire. A retirement party is when the boss says all those great things about you that he never said every time you asked for a raise. And uh, Tom at the retirement party was supposed to say, when we heard that you were retiring, we all got together to give you a little memento. But this, he got all mixed up and he made this mistake. He says, when we heard that, uh, this was at the party, and he says, when we heard that you were retiring, we all got together to give you this little momentum. At Paul's retirement party, uh, the boss said, we had this special gold watch made for you to honor you for your many years uh, with our company. It's a special gold watch. It takes a lot of winding up. It's very often late, and at quarter to five, it stops work. <laughs> Uh, here is the uh, judgment that Judge Burrow signed. He cut it down from $1,000 to $500. You give him credit for that. And 
So this is just going straight back to Robert Kalaji as soon as I get an opportunity to do that. I'm telling you folks, it's four or five, six legal papers every day refuting some lawyer's lie. Here is the nice uh, writ of petition for writ of certiorari that went to the United States Supreme Court. Isn't that nice? As I say, it has a docket number, but I'll have to give that to you next week. We have the story of Bryant Gardens where a co-op was for rent. Uh, it was not a condo, it was a co-op, and the owner rented it to us for $1,050 a month, and he should have only rented it to us for $600 because it was under the Emergency Tenant Protection Act administered by the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal. So there was a rent overcharge there, and that uh, landlord had to pay to me, the tenant, uh, $5,300 overcharge. Uh, and but the ETPA, the Emergency Tenant Protection Act, says that uh, if a landlord doesn't prove that this wasn't a willful overcharge, then uh, the landlord uh, has to pay three times that amount, triple damages. Well, uh, the landlord did not prove that it was not a willful overcharge. Uh, and the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal uh, broke their own law and didn't charge triple damages. So I took them to court, naturally, for negligences. Uh, it came before Judge Coppola, and Judge Coppola uh, ruled what was best for the judge, and he didn't stand up for right at all, and he didn't stand up for justice, and he told uh, the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal, their lawyer in the Bronx, was, who, who was totally inept. Uh, what was his name? Francisco Lazarus. Uh, he told him to submit an order, and Lazarus let 60 days go by without submitting an order. He didn't even know that there'd been a decision. That's how inept the you know, New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal is. Uh, this is one reason that I didn't vote for Como uh, again. Uh, and so, uh, so he forgot, he didn't know there was an order, and then he didn't submit an order for Coppola to sign, and so they would have let it go on forever, but there's a law against that, that you have to submit an order within 60 days, and if you don't uh, submit it in 60 days, you lose the decision. And so I pointed that out to Coppola, but Coppola, instead of uh, being on the bench to enforce the laws of the state of New York and of the Constitution, uh, he let that go. So that was a crooked thing to do. Uh, so naturally, I appealed Coppola's decision all the way through, and there'll be an oral argument on that uh, around about Christmas 1995. And then uh, also the same landlord violated the Emergency Tenant Protection Act in harassing a tenant to move. You can't do that. And he harassed this tenant to move 13 times, and I had it all on audio tape. I had, it was an open and shut case. And those cases you have to take down to William Street DHCR. That's where Stephen Cohen is. And so I took the case there, and uh, they were crooked from the beginning. Uh, they listened to the audio tapes, the proof was there, and then they just dropped the case. So uh, that case fell before Coppola. He'd made such a mess of the first case, he should have been recused himself from the second case. Good going, Ginny. Good going. Good jump. And, uh, but he didn't, and he made another uh, crooked decision, and uh, I have appealed that, and that will be argued probably at the same time in Christmas of 1995. That's Glendora versus Coppola, and the New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal. Any statements, Ginny? She, she just left. Bye, Ginny. Thanks. It was nice to see you. Must be going to the kitchen to get something to eat. She's all belly. Tenant, I would like to have you join the New York State uh, Association of uh, Tenants. Let's see, the New York State Tenants and Neighborhood Association. New York State Tenants and Ma Neighborhood Association, and they're in Manhattan. 
And if you're a tenant, you really should uh, join them because they have done wonderful things to help uh, tenants. And you know, the landlords have a million dollar lobby up in uh, uh, Albany, and of course that's what the legislators listen to, whereas the tenants don't have any money at all. So fight for tenants' right and join the New York State Tenants and Neighborhood Association. But the new young pastor who delivered a stirring sermon on gossip, and he closed the service with, I love to tell the story. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it's true. It satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory, the old story of Jesus and his love. I wasn't sure all the way through that that I could remember the words. So a Sunday school teacher said to her class, cleanliness is next to what? And the little boy said, next to impossible. And another Sunday school teacher said, Lot was warned to take his wife and flee out of the city. And his wife was turned into a pillar of salt. And the little girl said, what was the flea turned into? Katie is back. Katie is back. Katie is so far she won't eat unless I sit there with her. And I open the window so that she can go out and stay and cook a nice day. It's 50 degrees out. And it's 600 degrees under the uh, TV. And believe me, that's no condition for her underwear. Uh, now, I want to read you this. Thank you. Uh, this is the Center for Judicial Accountability. Thank you for responding to uh, our ad, October 26, in the op-ed page, on the op-ed op -ed page. You know what that is, don't you? They have the editorial page and then the page that's opposite that. Uh, of the New York Times reprinted in the November 1st issue of the New York Law Journal. There has been a tremendous outpouring of interest and concern from people all over the country. Many people are asking for help. Others are offering to help us. At this point, we are building a national citizens organization to deal with the problem of bad judges. Judges who are incompetent and judges who are dishonest. Dishonesty means judges who knowingly disregard their ethical duties. Are there a lot of those disobey clear and controlling law and who write decisions which fabricate or deliberately omit critical facts? By such incompetence and misconduct, these judges destroy individual lives, families, and businesses, and for ulterior reasons, torpedo important cases in which the public has a vital interest. The financial cost of appealing a judge's bad decision puts appeal out of reach for the average citizen. Yet those who make the financial sacrifice and undertake appeal are often met with the same realities on the appellate court level as in the lower court. Incompetent and corrupt judges create havoc at the trial level and overload the system with appeals. This puts the judicial system in crisis and, ex and is extremely costly to you taxpayers. That's put out by the Center for Judicial Accountability. That's one pe reason that people like cats. They're so playful. Come here, Katie. Come here, over here. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. Now then, what happened on Glendora versus uh, Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin? And this would be from um, February the 15th uh, to uh, today, February the 22nd, Washington's birthday, it says that we had a day of peace on Tuesday, Valentine's Day, and a day of peace on Wednesday, and a day of peace on Thursday, and a day of peace on Friday. 
Fridays when I went to the appellate division in Brooklyn, I had the oral argument on Glendora versus CBS and to catch them at their law breaking. Uh, on Saturday, uh, it took a long, almost all day to recharge the telephone batteries and uh, to uh, go through 40 Gelman audio tapes, but it was a day of peace. Uh, and uh, Glendora typed out her uh, protest to Cousins bossing Judge Wood around. And I'll read you that in just a second, both what he said and the protest to the same. Uh, Sunday was a day of peace. Uh, this was mailing number 123 on Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin. Uh, the number of pages is 2,516. And I've forgotten how many volumes there are, 22 volumes. Uh, the costs uh, last week on wall were $17. The number of hours was nine. It was a week of peace. And this is exhibit Omnicron, Omnicron. And uh, here is a cousin's letter uh, to Judge Wood. This is Wilson Babe, Comboy Coza Cousins. This is the law firm that changes its name every week. And he's writing to the Supreme Court of the State of New York County of Westchester. Attention, Honorable Harold L. Wood. At the court conference on January 18, 1995, the court issued a ruling on the stenographic record that the court would hold in abeyance any decision, High Kate, concerning the defendant's application as to the plaintiff's production of video and audio tapes. In other words, they want to look at my video tapes and hear my audio tapes so they can prepare their lies for trial, how they're going to lie around the truth. Therefore, I would request that the court withdraw its decision dated January 30th, 1995, ordering the plaintiff to produce all video and audio tapes now scheduled for February 27th, 1995. This is uh, Cousins. Uh, I'll give you his name. Cousins' name is John C. Cousins, Jr. Remember, it was his father that Judge Wood knew. Uh, the court's ruling on the stenographic record of January 18, 1995, which I bought for $15, would in effect supersede the court's written decision dated January 30th, 1995. The court further ordered at that same conference of January 18, 1995, that the court's ultimate decision regarding audio and videotapes would be held in abeyance until the court decides the defendant's pending motion for dismissal and or summary judgment. I would respectfully request that the court respond to this instant application to vacate the court's decision dated January 30th, 1995, in order to timely advise the plaintiff pro se that the discovery and inspection now scheduled for February 27th, 1995 has been adjourned. Well, it's Thursday, Wednesday, and it hasn't been adjourned yet. Please note I am sending a copy of this letter directly to the plaintiff pro se. Very truly yours, Wilson Babe Comboy Coza and Cousins, John C. Cousins, Jr. to Glendora, Box 416, White Plains, New York. Well, now, I see a whole lot wrong with that. If you can understand from that letter what's going on, what's going on is that uh, Cousins said at the February 18th, well, let me read you my letter of protest. And this goes to Judge Harold Wood, Chief Judge Judith Kay, Judge Joseph J. Trafficanti, who is the uh, Chief Administrative Judge for the Office of Court Administration for New York State Courts outside of Manhattan, New York City, and Judge E. Leo Malonis, who is in charge of court administration in New York City. Gerald Stern, Commission on Judicial Conduct, Judge Angelo Ingracia, Administrative Judge, 9th and 10th Judicial Districts, Gary Casella, Grievance Committee, 9th and 10th Judicial Districts, John C. Cousins, Jr., Wilson Babe Law Firm, Bruce Bendish, Esquire, Glendora's TV audience, and that's you. To all of you, uh, Ray Gardet, C. play the enclosed letter from Lawyer Cousins to Judge Wood of February 15, 1995. Now we know who is running the Judge Wood Court. It is not Judge Wood, it is John Cousins, Kevin Conboy, Michael Koza, Kevin O'Dell, Leo McGrath, and Alexander Karamitsos of Wilson Bay Law Firm. Now you know why 17 consecutive unilateral decisions in favor of the Cousins Group and against Glendora have emanated from the Judge Wood Court. 
Now you know why Glendora's case has languished one year and four months with the Judge Wood Court not accomplishing one ounce of justice or anything else. It was not a ruling by Judge Wood. He actually said nothing. It was a demand by Cousins. Both Glendora and husband Franklin are witnesses. This record shows how Cousins et al. were really not interested in the audio tapes as a legitimate discovery request, but were only interested in delaying Glendora's right to get Judge Wood to declare her case ready for trial. Glendora has suffered initially 500 injuries, that is, tortious acts, from Easter 1993 to November 1993 when she filed her complaint, and since the complaint was filed, Glendora has suffered 1,200 injuries, that is, tortious acts, while seeking justice in the Westchester Supreme Court. Judge Wood is getting paid $113,000 a year by us taxpayers so the Wilson Babe firm can make his decisions. Cousins et al will, quote, put in abeyance, unquote, anything to stall Glendora's certification of ready for trial. They know they will lose a trial because Glendora has a law breaking of Walsh, Alpucci, and Larkin on videotape. The biggest revelation out of this cousin's letter of February 15, 1995, is their arrogant confidence that Judge Wood is going to rule in their favor the 18th time and dismiss Glendora's complaint and or grant summary judgment. A case of this magnitude, as Glendora pointed out in her cross motion of 150 pages, cannot be dismissed by Judge Wood. This Cousins Law Group lost on delaying trial certification through depositions because Glendora sacrificed 20 hours answering all of Coase's questions to the point where he said, I'm unsatisfied. We repeat here, paragraph 33 of Glendora's protests of February 10, 1995, the 17th consecutive unilateral decision by Judge Wood in favor of the Cousins Group. A person in the courthouse tower said to Franklin that the Wilson Bay firm has effective political connections. Franklin said that has been apparent in the Judge Wood court. The person replied, oh yes, lawyers in the firm say jump, and Judge Wood says how high. Glendora, in spite of this haughty and bossy letter, will appear with four file boxes of 675 audio tapes and videotapes, each one and a half to two hours long, for cousins at all to screen and queue up and log which parts they want dubbed and to tell Glendora which editing house they have engaged to build them. She and Franklin will carry the 60 pounds of tapes up five floors to the Cousins Law Firm, as Judge Wood ordered. Do you know what this is an example of? A lawyer friend of Glendora said to her, don't ask for something, you might get it. Glendora, in her protest of February 10, 1995, told you all that in the Judge Wood court, the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. Quote, adjourned or not, unquote, Glendora and Franklin will be there. Cousins bossing Judge Wood extends to his directing Judge Wood that Cousins has already informed Glendora that Judge Wood's decision of January 30th, 1995 is being vacated by Cousins. He is saying, I have sent Glendora a letter telling her I vacated your decision. Now you see how the arrogance of Coles are calling the Judge Wood court August the 22nd when Glendora refused to be bullied and hoodwinked by Coza, all fits in with the Wilson court, the Wilson gang, excuse me, running the Judge Wood court. Has not Glendora said all along and moved that Judge Wood should recuse himself? He is grossly unqualified to handle her case. Months ago, he should have certified it ready for trial, even though it takes Westchester Supreme Court a year to get a trial going after it's certified.
Rockland, Manhattan, Nassau County. Other than the above, there here is today's joke. It was a coal mine, and the foreman hired an Irish man, a Polish man, and a Chinese man. He said to the Irish man, your job is to bring the big chunks of coal out of the mine. And he said to the Polish man, your job is to break up the coal into smaller pieces. And he said to the Chinese man, I'll put you in charge of supplies. And so the foreman went away. He came back in the afternoon. The Irish man was doing his job just fine. The Polish man was doing his job well. And nobody had seen the Chinese man all day. So the foreman went deep into the mine. He's going down a long, narrow corridor, pitch black. And the Chinese man jumps out and says, surprise! Yours in truth, Glendora. Now, Katie is sleeping on the log. And uh, I would like to get out this log because I would like to know, have you know, Oh, I told you that, how many hours and how many dollars. And this is the log for this week. Uh, Sunday was a day of peace. Monday was a day of peace. Tuesday was a day of peace. This is Wednesday, and by 3.19 uh, uh, p.m. in the afternoon, it has been a day of peace. And that's all that happened on Wall, El Pucci, and Larkin. And what are you waiting for? You're waiting to see if Judge Wood is going to dismiss this case. And uh, you're waiting to see if uh, Judge Wood is going to sign uh, a restraining order that Glendora not get in touch uh, with any employee of General Accident uh, who whose shareholders are being ripped off by this law firm, Wilson Babe, Koza Cousins, Convoy, Odell, McGrath, Karamitsos. The shareholders are being ripped off, paying all those excessive fees for minutes and for depositions and for conferences and for so-called, uh, you can't even call them, for these papers that they write that are so bad. I think the shareholders have a right to know. Hey, and welcome to a chat with Glendora. And here's your three jokes to start off with. Uh, Noah said, to the two snakes as they left the ark. Noah said to the two snakes as they left the ark, go forth and multiply. And the snakes said, we can't, we're adders. And uh, at the banquet, the MC said, we're sorry that our guest, Father Raymond Adu, could not be here tonight to say the benediction. So without further ado, good night. And as John said to his wife, he said, as Mason said to Dixon, we have to draw the line someplace. And now this is what happened on Glendora versus Philip Amicone, the White Plains Building Commissioner and uh, former mayor of White Plains, uh, Plains, Alfred Del Vecchio, and the White Plains Building Department. Uh, through the... Uh, Negligence of the uh, Appellate Division, Second Department, New York State Supreme Court. Uh, I was not notified of my oral argument. That was not my fault. Uh, and I asked them to reschedule my oral argument. Naturally, that's what one would do. And the judges said no. These judges are Lawrence, uh, Thompson, Goldstein, and Hart. So, I got out another formal application. I already read you the first one, to which they said no. And so this is the second one. And it says urgent. Uh, let me first of all read you Martin Brownstein's letter. Martin Brownstein is the clerk of the court. Dear Glendora, in response to your letter dated February 9, 1995, the justices sitting on the above appeal have refused to reschedule the matter for argument, and it's their fault. Okay, so this is the second application, and it says urgent. Please consider this re before you write your decision. 
And it's uh, the New York Supreme Court Appellate Division, Second Department, Glendora Plaintiff Appellant versus Philip Amico and Alfred Del Vecchio and the White Plains Building Department. Case number is 9306410. Uh, this is way back to 1993, and here it is, 1995. And even at that, I can't get my oral argument. Presiding Judges Thompson, Lawrence, Hart, and Goldstein, notice of motion to reschedule oral argument since it was the court's fault Glendora was never notified. Please take notice that upon the attached affidavit of Glendora sworn to February 16th, 1995, and upon all prior pleadings and herein, the plaintiff the appellant Glendora will move this court at 45 Monroe Place, Brooklyn, New York, 11201 on the third day of March, 1995, or as soon thereafter as can be heard for an order to reschedule oral arguments since it was the court's fault that Glendora was never notified. White Plains, New York, February 16, 1995. Yours in truth, Glendora, Box 416, White Plains, New York, 914-949-9495. To Robert F. Pagano, Wilson, Elser, Moskowitz, Edelman, and Dicker, 150 East 42nd Street, New York, New York, 10017. Urgent, please consider this before you write your decision. Now that was the notice of motion, and here's the affidavit. Glendora being duly sworn deposes and says her reasons follow for moving this court to reschedule oral arguments since it was the court's fault Glendora was never notified. It was not Glendora's fault that she did not appear for the oral argument on February the 7th, 1995, Tuesday, 10 a.m. It was the court's fault. You all know Glendora better than that. You know she would not miss an oral argument. She has been going to your court voluntarily for years just to watch you, even when she has no oral argument. You know that. She has been to your court 16 times to watch you since 1992. She has never missed your court in White Plains in two years. This is no way to treat a fan. You know that Glendora would have been there at 10 a.m. February 7th, 1995, Tuesday, to argue orally. It is the court's fault she was not there. Further, Glendora did, not, did come from White Plains to Brooklyn on that very day to perfect her Judge Donald N. Silverman appeal. She got to the court in the afternoon. It is only common sense that she would have perfected the Silverman appeal in the morning after the oral argument instead of in the afternoon if she had known about the oral argument. Glendora is, incis is incisively prejudiced by your not rescheduling her oral argument on the basis of her letter to Clerk Martin, Br Martin Brownstein immediately after she found out about the courts not notifying her of the February 7th oral argument. You are denying my first, fifth, and 14th amendment rights to petition my government for redress of wrongs and for due process. I was there. I was there in the afternoon because the court did not notify me. I would have been there and there in the morning if the court had notified me. Glendora waited 18 months for this oral argument. Do you think that she would have missed it if you had done your job and notified her? And this appeal has cost Glendora $550. Do you think that she would throw away her oral argument after sinking $550 and 300 hours into this appeal? This court is falling apart. In two years, there has been glaringly visible degeneration in its operations. Clerk entry error, computer error, and now error in notification of an oral argument. A clerk wrote that I did not submit a notice of appeal with a motion when it was right there in front of him. A clerk wrote that I did not submit a copy of the order appealed from when it was right there in front of him. The court is not doing its job. It is not taking care of the citizens of New York State. A reason is that you are overloaded. You are overworked. You are ridiculously behind, but as Glendora has publicized so many times, if there were not so many bad judges in the Westchester Supreme Court, you would not be 18 months behind. It is not all your fault. Glendora has done four appeals in the United States Court of Appeals, and one third of the time it takes you to do one appeal. Your court is badly in need of revision and revitalization. It is the worst court Glendora has encountered in her odyssey through court purgatory, all because high school taught her the lie there was justice in the courts. This court never was much good anyway. Just look at the record and see the injuries this court has heaped on Glendora. Every other court Glendora has been in, the appellate term, the United States Court of Appeals, the United States Supreme Court, makes the lower court clerk submit the record on appeal. You make an appellant go to all that work and expense and time to gather the record on appeal. Maybe the New York State Court of Appeals does too, but they never hear one's appeals anyhow. We pay them all that money and we never get an appeal. 
First, Glendora gets injured by a negligent buildings commissioner, a negligent mayor, a negligent buildings department who do not protect her health and safety. Then she gets injured by a lying lawyer. Next, she is injured by a judge who disregards his ethical duties. Then she is injured by all the work time and expense of perfecting an appeal of this judge's disregard of controlling law. Isn't that enough? Why does she have to be injured by a calendar clerk who can't get out a notification of her oral argument and by your not rescheduling it when she told you the next day it was not her fault? Is it because you have already decided in favor of these indolent and slothful lawbreakers? Remember, Judge Garayan's decision is illegal. It was late. Purse went to CPLR 2219. He had 60 days to make a decision. He was 11 days untimely. Remember also that Judge Garayan lost in the November election. So did Mayor Del Vecchio. Glendora was right, and after Glendora's lawsuit, there were big spreads in the newspaper about the building's department cracking down on illegal occupancy. What was your reason for denying my February 9, 1995 application for rescheduling my oral argument, of which your court did not notify me? Glendora has a lot to say about these negligent defendants and a right to say it. Many facets of her life have been ruined. Enough is enough. Already, an old Brooklyn expression. Clerk Brownstein was assiduous in his praiseworthy effort to bring my February 9, 1995 application before you and in notifying me by phone of your outrageous decision. And it, they notified me last week, right in the middle of videotaping, right in the middle of reporting to you. And I said something about it then to you last week. Glendora and husband Franklin praise Martin Brownstein. The bad news came in the middle of Glendora's videotaping her TV programs for this week. She immediately announced the latest news, another court breakdown. After the videotaping and strenuous editing of her program, she went to sleep at 9 p.m. on time, but was awakened at 12.30 a.m. by the gross injustice of losing her oral argument, the unhappy sinking feeling feeling in her stomach kept her from sleeping anymore. She has been up all night writing this motion to hand into the appellate division this morning, February 16, when it comes to White Plains, and she goes to watch it, as she has every time for two years, whether she has an oral argument or not. Judge Thompson is not Glendora's favorite presiding justice. Several times he has been more like the gutter than the marble halls. Glendora has said so on TV and it must have got back to him. It is not fair what you did. Glendora has seen this court do bad things, but this is one of the worst, denying her oral argument when it was the court's fault she was not present. Glendora remembers the blizzardy cold December 6, 1993, when she trudged over snowbanks to the White Plains Post Office to serve and submit her 11 records on appeal and 11 appellants briefs for this case. After this was done, she went to the central jury room of the Westchester County Courthouse and watched the appellate division judges Thompson, Rosenblatt, Ritter, and Miller where four pages one through and seven state the reasons this panel should reschedule Glendora's oral argument, which this court caused her to miss on February 7, 1995. Dated White Plains, New York, February 16, 1995, 4.33 a.m. Yours in truth, Glendora, and so forth. Subscribed and sworn to, and it was notarized by Francis Harrison. I've got to send a copy of this to Judge Mancano, and Judge Traficanti, Judge Ingrassia, Judge Malonis, and Judge K. It is just not just. And here are some exhibits. My letter to Brownstein that I read you last week. And with a notice of appeal of this bad Judge Garayan decision and uh, his bad decision. And also a statement of how bad judges are by the Center for Judicial Accountability out my oral argument, the things that I would have said. And the first page of that is done. The paste up and the third and fourth are done. And every day I try to work 15 minutes on it, except that every day I get a lie from Kalaji and I have to sit down and refute that and set the record straight. So the speaker at the banquet says, I'm going to close now. I have two minutes left for my allotted speaking time, and I have to save that for the applause. The sign in the restaurant window said, don't make fun of our coffee. Someday you'll be old and weak too. And Marilyn says, whenever I feel down in the dumps, I get new clothes. And Dorothy says, oh, is that where she gets them? And this is Glendora versus CBS Incorporated, Howard Stringer. Uh, Matthew uh, Margo, Beth Bresson, Marty Daly, Matt Steinfeld, Steinfeld 
uh, Joseph Abrecis, and uh, Peter Lund. These are all CBS people who broke the law, and I sued them. And then Judge Rosado broke the law, and uh, so I had to appeal a decision. That's more bad work of judges. These appeals are a pain in the neck. They take 300 hours. They take, they cost $550. Uh, and here I am for the oral argument scheduled February the 17th, uh, 1995. I got up at 5 a.m. I left White Plains at 6.40 a.m. I got to Brooklyn at 7.40 a.m. You have to get there that early because you have to find a parking space. And I was trying to find my case for you. And I did the argument around about, uh, I didn't do the argument around about, it was approximately at uh, quarter to noon. And I can't even find it for you. There it is, Glendora versus CBS Incorporated. Right down here at the bottom. Who were the justices? Uh, Law, um, oh, Connor? No, 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 Sullivan. <laughs> Sullivan uh, was the presiding justice. I'd been before him in the Gannett uh, libel case. Um, a new man, Kraussman, uh, Copertino, and uh, Hart, who refused to reschedule an oral argument for me on Amico. And here is my oral argument. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to type it uh, before I went. It was typed afterward. Anyway, good morning. My name is Glendora, and I thank you for the privilege of an oral argument. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our God, our strength, and our Redeemer. Point Alpha. The first grounds for review is that Judge Rosado's decision is illegal. Soon after this decision, Judge Rosado was sent to Orange County. As Judge Ingratia said at the induction of judges, which Glendora videotaped for her program, he should have been sent to Buffalo. CPLR 2219 states that an order determining a motion shall be made in 60 days after the motion is submitted for a decision. There's the law right there, CPLR 2919. Judge Rosado had until August the 18th, 1993 to get his decision in. He did not make it until September 12, 1993. This is one month and one week untimely. So Plaintiff Glendora asked this court to vacate this illegal decision. CBS Incorporated, Stringer, Lund, Abrazis, Bresnan, Margo, Daly, Steinfeld, and Jacobs never answered this point. Judges are there to see that the law is carried out. Judges cannot go around breaking the law any more than anybody else can. For this reason, Judge Rosado's decision does not count. It will be interesting to see how you handle this one. The whole world will be watching. Point beta, this decision and order were reached without any testimony being taken, without any witnesses sworn, without any evidence taken. There was no trial, there was no jury. Glendora was denied due process. Her first, fifth, and fourteenth amendment rights were violated. It was a correspondence school, not a court. Point gamma, Judge Rosado never heard the audio tape evidence. Glendora provided it and he ignored it. Six months after the matter was in the hands of the Appellate Division, Second Department, Judge Rosado's secretary said to Judge Silverman's court clerk, the next time you see Glendora in the court, House ask her to see me, so Glendora did. The secretary said, there's an audio tape up here that belongs to you. Glendora says, that is the evidence. It goes with the papers, the county clerk's office. Point Delta, this decision order does not deal with the issue of the negligences of CBS and injured plaintiff. This decision leaves out two-thirds of the issue. Certainly a judge is there to deal with the plaintiff's complaint and not with the defense lawyer's aberrations, extraneous and detours. Certainly a judge should read carefully a plaintiff's list of negligences and deal exclusively with those, even though deceitful defense lawyer tries to distract the judge and lead him astray. This decision order is not made on the merits of the case. Judge Rosado does not address nor discuss the merits of the case. Instead, he goes around and around the perimeter, never dealing with defendant's negligences and consequent personal injury to plaintiff. It is all penumbra and no core. 
point epsilon. Glendora was denied her constitutional right to a fair and impartial tribunal. Judge Rosado and his law clerk had already made up their minds CBS was going to win. Judge and law clerk rule in favor of the big guy, the lawyer, the rich, the powerful. Just read their decision and it is obvious that it happened this way. Glendora's rights to due process were denied. Due process mandates a verdict in which the judge has no personal interest. Point Zeta, defendants have no defense and never will have. Point Eta, there is no dispute of facts. Defendants and their lawyer never dealt with the facts. Point Theta, CBS does not have to worry about breaking the laws nor about being afraid of lawsuits in the courts because the courts are afraid of CBS. They know CBS will win. They have the money. They have the airtime. They have the audience. They have the influence. The political bosses wouldn't dare let a decision go against CBS. I'm reading you the paste-up copy. The master hasn't been made yet. The facts are against CBS and the law is against CBS, but the judge is for CBS. Nowhere do defendants deal with a specific charge of negligences. Plaintiff has the whole chronology on audio tape submitted to the court as evidence. Again, the facts and the law are being swept under the rug to give the judge a way out to rule in favor of CBS. Point Kappa. The issue was not the FCC. The issue was not the public airwaves. The issue was negligence. Point Lambda. The issue was not Slander, the issue is negligence. Point move. Defendants don't have a duty of care after Glendora has paid them $25,000 cash. Glendora understands the first rule of oral argument. If you don't strike oil in 10 minutes, stop drilling. The second is the mind cannot absorb more than the seat can endure. And the third is a good oral argument to be immortal does not have to be eternal. Point new. Judge Rosado on page 2, line 13, brushes over the gravamen of the case. Negligences. Point Omicron, freedom from mental disturbance is a protected interest. Judge Rosado should know that, and damages may be recovered on cause of action for same. The CBS conduct was extreme and outrageous and was reckless and is liable for infliction of emotional distress. The CBS conduct went beyond all possible bounds of decency, was atrocious, and is utterly intolerable in civilized community. Judge Rosado brushes off negligence and follows a CBS lawyer down a deceitful detour of breach of contract when plaintiff never even mentioned breach of contract. Glendora apologizes for reading from a prepared manuscript. The United States Supreme Court looks, quote, with disfavor, unquote, on reading from a prepared manuscript, but they give you 30 minutes for an oral argument. You do not, even though I do commercials. In 30 seconds on the NBC television network, coast to coast, I can't condense this case into your time constraint. Points I, Judge Rosado does not stand up for the public, but for greedy big business. Point rule, Judge Rosado is wrong to let CBS abuse the public's airwaves. Judge Rosado is wrong in being bullied, oh, that was point ta, by CBS to say Glendora cannot redress her government for wrong. Point sigma, Judge Rosado ignores the malice of CBS. Point phi, defendants, respondents in their brief did not refute any of the points Glendora made in her appellant's brief. So Glendora, therefore, was on, wins on all of these points. The points are unopposed. Point Chi, this case had nothing to do with breach of contract. For Judge Rosado to mention it in his decision was a filler. CBS defendants did not negotiate in a free and open market. They monopolized the public's airwaves. They discriminated. Point Omega, CBS was dishonest. They contrived false excuses. The commercials were not up to broadcast standard. Quote, unquote, is a lie. The commercials had already been broadcast 10 times. Maine to California. A commercial not up to broadcast standard can be negotiated to be put up to broadcast standard. Judges are pro se about TV. Who is running the country? Not you. Not the courts, not the FCC, but CBS. Advertising to people to buy TV commercials is too narrow for the network is another lie. When WCBS TV and WCBS radio have advertised for years for people to buy time on their stations. Glendora has been in TV twice as long as any of them, including Lawrence Tisch. They never put anything in writing. Quote, they had complaints, unquote, was never, was never substantiated. They never had proof of anything they alleged. They ran away and hid. They served the court in person before they served Glendora. The service was improper. By CPLR 3711B, Glendora should have won because defendants had no meritorious defense and the defense they stated had no merit. They broke the law. Then they lied. Then their lawyer lied. The record is in the archives forever and on TV forever. Since the other side submitted, may I please have their 15 minutes? You know, CBS never showed up. They submitted. That's how cocky they are, how arrogant, and how sure that they're running the courts.
Appeal judges never look a pro se in the eye nor ask a pro se questions. Your new courtroom in White Plains is beautiful. For the first time in three years of monitoring the second department, I could hear every word. Presiding Judge Mangano was thrilled with the new courtroom. Glendora watched the whole session yesterday from 10 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. And Judge Ruder said yesterday he had the quote of the day, being a pro se is a shield, not a sword. For the life of her, Glendora cannot see why you did not schedule her oral argument in White Plains yesterday three blocks from her home instead of making her come all the way to Brooklyn today. Not that I am not thrilled to be again with your nice clerks and your New York court officers. Judge Van Grafelin of the United States Court of Appeals always asks an oral argument, what do you want us to do for you? <laughs> well, one, I want you to vacate this decision by R Judge Rosado as illegal, pursuant to CPLR 2219, to award Glendora $110,000 for personal injury by 33 negligences inflicted upon her by these defendants, and three, grant her the cost of this action, and what other further and different relief you can see fit. Yours in truth, Glendora, thank you for my day in court, February the 17th, 1995, Friday at 12.38 p.m. If you affirm this decision in order, you are standing up for evil. In your court, the good guy should win. And what did the judge say to the dentist? Do you swear to pull the tooth, the whole tooth, and nothing but the tooth? Got it printed and to distribute it to the defendants, uh, CBS Stringer, Everzees, Peter Lund, Beth Bresson, Matthew Margo, Marty Daly, Matt Steinfeld, and uh, to also send it to the other judges around New York courtland. Um, I wrote this note to the court officer, do I have time to feed a meter and save myself a $40 parking ticket? And the court officer says, you have at least a half an hour. He looked at the uh, calendar. Uh, I got up at uh, a Friday morning at, uh, no, I got up Friday night. I went to sleep at 9 o'clock, my regular time to go to sleep, and I got up at 11 o'clock because I knew this wasn't written, and I wrote it out. I didn't have time to type it. I had to read it from longhand. Uh, I had a good time down there in Brooklyn. I always do. I like going to Brooklyn. They have good treats. I spent $8 uh, in parking and $9 in treats. I went to see Joseph Derby. Excuse me. I went to see Joseph Hurley in the United States Bankruptcy Court in Brooklyn, the Eastern District, because he's the only one I didn't sue. And Glendora versus Conrad Duberstein and uh, Judge Hall and all those. Uh, and uh, I wanted to see him, but he was in a conference call, but I did see Dominici, the man who's in charge of the security down there. I went up and looked in the three courtrooms. There wasn't a judge anywhere. Uh, but I did see Diane. I was glad to see Diane. She's awfully nice. And her husband has died. It's very, very, very sad. He died in January. Uh, Copertino, uh, doesn't look as well as he used to. He's pale and I'm kind of worried about him. Uh, Solomon did uh, say not to interrupt you, Glendora. He says, but uh, was breach of contract an issue? And I said, no, it wasn't. Uh, actually, I should have said to him it wasn't even a cause of action and that this was breach of contract was introduced by Douglas Jacobs, the CBS attorney, just to confuse Judge Rosado, and Douglas Jacobs succeeded. Judge Rosado was confused. Breach of contract had nothing to do with it at all. That's what they do instead of dealing with the merits of the case. And that's what I told you about the detours. Okay, how many hours did this uh, oral argument require so far?
Glendora. You must get it in before the Ides of March. Judge Wood, what's going to happen? Glendora, I don't know. That's when Julius Caesar was murdered. The court, my decision will tell you when to come back here. Well, I had the, uh, I had the uh, answer in long before the 30th. I had it in seven days before the 30th. And I want you to carefully note that uh, on the motion to dismiss, Wilson Bave, Cousins, Coza, Conboy, Odell, McGrath, Karamitsos did not submit a reply affidavit. And then Bendish came along with saying, me too. I want to dismiss me too. Now, this is uh, a mailing that never got out. This was what happened uh, on the February 20th, 1995 week. Uh, on Monday, all is quiet, beautiful weather. $1.17 to mail cousins, bossing Judge Wood around. $2.93 to print wall log. Uh, $2.84 to mail the wall log. It was a day of peace. February 21st was a day of peace. peace. February 22nd, Wednesday, was a day of peace so far. At 6 p.m., there was a noisy boombox car that should not have been in this driveway at all. Only four cars should come in this driveway. Uh, on Thursday, queued up 70 Gelman audio tapes and logged in in preparation for the trial tonight in Manhattan City Court. Uh, queued up the remainder of the Gilman tapes. I missed the pine tree outside my living room window right out here, the west window. It was so nice, that pine tree. And the poor thing got loaded down with wet snow and it fell over. It's very sad. I paid for the furnace for the month of February, $28. This place is toasty warm, it's very nice. Good weather since August, excepting the snowstorm, February the 4th, when the pine tree fell down. And the cold is, uh, we had cold a few days later of eight degrees. But that's the only two storms we had for the whole winter. Judge Wood did exactly what Cousins told him to do. The producing of the audio tapes and videotapes Monday has been canceled, along with the production of the dubs a month later, Crooks, show you the tapes are just a stall. It shows you that the tapes were just a stall. They really didn't want the tapes. They were just doing it to delay trial. In spite of what you read in newspapers, people do not die in alphabetical order. On Sunday, we did the laundry and went to church. And at 3 p.m., I stood out in the field in the sunshine. It was nice. I'm outstanding in my field, right? Uh, 4 p.m., James Walsh, noise with the basketball back and forth. It was harassment, it was a violation of White Plains Noise Ordinance, and it was intentional infliction of emotional distress, deliberately. Uh, and the girls in 3C uh, were sort of noisy. James Walsh finally went and played with the girls in 3C. Glendora has to keep her south bedroom window closed, so Theo Alpucci will not open both windows halfway up. Uh, there was no time to answer Cousins Wood but I finally did get it answered and it went out and I just read it to you. And now what we have is a log for this week, the week of the February the 27th. Uh, on Monday, I wrote the protest all over the state that I just read to you and then it was mailed on Tuesday. Monday was a day of peace and Tuesday was a day of peace. And Tuesday was Fat Tuesday, that's when you uh, we went to the All Saints Episcopal Church in uh, Harrison, and we had pancakes. That was Fat Tuesday. Martin says, I see spots before my eyes. And Matthew said, have you seen a doctor? And Martin says, no, just spots. And the doctor said to Harry, uh, there's nothing I can do to help you. Your disease is hereditary. And Harry says, okay, send the bill to my father. And little Johnny says, 
Our dog is like one of the family. And Ed says, yeah? Which one? This is hard word to know to begin on Glendora versus Michael Gelman, the man who doesn't have the ethics to return your property, and the man who doesn't have the ethics to admit what he's done wrong and to atone for it. And here it is, this little $120 lawsuit has gone up to three volumes. And the number of hours put in on Michael Gelman has been something like 550 hours. And the costs have been uh, something like $85. And It's really tough to know where to begin and pick it up from where we left it before. But let me think a minute. Check in, remember that December the 22nd, excuse me, uh, February the 22nd, the day before the trial, the Gelman trial, uh, Franklin and Glendora uh, screened audio tapes 601 to 676. And we queued up the Gelman uh, what had to do with Gelman on those tapes. The conversations, they weren't conversations, but the announcements to the Gelman office uh, about the demands and other things. And that covered the period of uh, 1990, well, five and 1994. You know, this is so mammoth, so huge that it's really hard to remember. And uh, so that's why we keep logs and that's why we have audio tapes. So my plan Thursday, the day of the trial, was to log what was on the tapes and to make sure that all 120 Gelman tapes were uh, queued up, ready to go, and to review what was said on them and to write it down. And here is the, uh, the logging. It, the, the logging itself is uh, 11 pages. No, it's 12 pages. No, it's 11 pages. All right, so Franklin and I started that at 5.58 a.m. And we did fine with the first 10 and with the first 20. And then the first 30, it started to get bogged down because the tapes were not queued up and the excerpts had to be found again. And uh, so doing nothing from 5.58 a.m. to until 3 p.m. Thursday, February the 23rd, 1995. Uh, and I was only up to audio tape 55 out of 120 of the Gelman excerpts. So it began to look hopeless. Uh, I had to go to uh, TCI uh, to edit. At 3 o'clock, I started preparing for that. And then I started packing up the, uh, what was needed for the trial, uh, which was for 6.30 p.m. And, uh, and I only had 55 tapes, so I went to TCI and started the editing. And then at 4.30 p.m., Franklin and I had to head for the south to the Scarsdale Post Office, the Bronx River Parkway, the Cross County, the Deegan, the uh, 3rd Avenue Bridge, the FDR. There were just a couple of tie-ups. And we tried to go to the Seventh Day Store uh, near the New York Public Library on 5th Avenue and 40th Street. Uh, but the traffic was uh, impossible, so we had to ditch that. Uh, we also had to ditch Manhattan cable TV going down there, which meant other trips, two other trips. And uh, so we had to rush down to the city court of Manhattan. I uh, sat in the back seat of the Lincoln, uh, queuing up audio tapes as fast as I could. 
uh, getting ready for the trial to play these audio tapes showing where Gilman was showing uh, irresponsibility and lack of ethics uh, to do his duty, which was to return our tape, our property. And uh, we got to the Manhattan court at 6. We found a parking place on Lafayette. That's at 111 Center Street. And uh, Franklin took in uh, two boxes of tapes. I left out 10 tapes to see if I couldn't uh, queue up some more. What did I tell you? I was up to about 77. And out of 120, and then the batteries gave out, and I only had one set of batteries left charged. So I had to give up that and go to the court, and we sat. And uh, they opened the court a little late, we, but we sat in the front row, and that Thursday night, there were only like 150 people, litigants in the court, instead of all the other nights we've been there when it's 300 and it's packed. Uh, and so one judge came in, a man, or anyway, a person in a black robe came in, a man, and that turned out to be uh, Judge Stallman. And then another judge came in, that was or a woman in a black robe, and that turned out, I, I don't know what judge that turned out to be. But Judge Stallman was sort of personable in his announcements, and the other judges never made announcements. They just came and sat down on the bench, and uh, at the bench. and. Uh, so our Glendora versus Michael Gellman was called. Glendora stood and said, plaintiff, ready for trial by the court. And then another strange woman said something. I didn't get a chance to look at her until they called us down. And they didn't even have a sit in the front row. They had a stand by the calendar clerk. And uh, my goodness, they told us to go to room 106, which is a trial room, and it has we uh, in God We Trust on it. Over in the uh, 107, the big courtroom, it says in God, E-Trust. The W is messy. And uh, so we went in, and there was a woman at the bench and another woman in front of the desk, uh, at the desk in front of the bench. And that woman at the bench turned out to be Judge Sarah Lee Evans. And uh, the woman at the other desk turned out to be the stenographer court stenographer. Uh, and then this woman I've never seen before, I don't think who has any legal position at all, who was appearing for Gelman and DiGiulio, said that uh, Gelman and DiGiulio would be here momentarily, and she was standing there for them. And Judge uh, Evans got the drift right away and says, oh, well, you just need more time. So in a couple of minutes, DiGiulio and Gelman came, but why didn't they answer the, cal the calendar call? And they came in from the 106 door to the hall instead of the 106 uh, uh, entrance from the 107 big courtroom. What were they pulling off? Gelman thinks he's too high and mighty that he can't associate with a hoi polloi. Ginny, or Katie, rather, you're Agudius Maximus is getting too well known on TV. Uh, so, when all were gathered in the courtroom, let me uh, just summarize. There was Franklin and Glendora, Gelman and uh, DiGiulio, and this uh, unknown woman, Judge Evans, and the court stenographer. And it's a little courtroom, so it's kind of chummy and cozy. I had to pull the curtain so that Katie in jumping up on the windowsill wouldn't pull down the curtains and the curtain rod as she's done several times before. These cats are such a nuisance. You save their lives and you wait on them hand and foot for years and years. They don't do anything for you, but all they do is make you trouble. Uh, all right. Like Michael Gelman. Uh, I had an opportunity to look Michael Gelman straight in the eye for a long time and look into his unethical soul and his irresponsible soul. Uh, he was wearing a ponytail, and uh, that makes people look like 
of Horsus Gluteus Maximus. And uh, he is young, and he has sort of gray, grayish blue eyes. Uh, he has sort of a long nose. Uh, and uh, he was wearing a shirt and tie and a pretty blue jacket. And the rest you would expect. So I looked at him for a long time for all of the grief that he has caused me by his irresponsibility and his lack of ethics. So I guess uh, Judge uh, um, Evans told Glendora, why don't you tell me what happened? Tell your story, which is good. And because uh, she's trying to get it settled, which is good. And the rest I think I'm going to read you that I was keeping uh, on uh, Wednesday and Thursday before the crush and rush uh, took all the organization out of everything. And that was the queuing up of the tapes, 676 tapes. And I must have started that project when? Sometime in January? I guess I worked something like 30 days, and it was up to three to four, seven hours a day uh, on this Gelman audio tape evidence. So that would be the first page. Uh, and Judge Evans uh, had a very appealing smile every now and then, Sarah Lee Evans. Uh, Glendora introduced her husband to Judge Evans, Franklin. So there, that first two pages are done. Telling of my story was off the record. And Glendora uh, said that on Christmas 1989, uh, she called uh, live and Michael Gellman answered the phone and Glendora told Michael Gellman how she told jokes and might cheer up people, uh, that she had been on David Letterman and that she had been on the CNBC uh, cable television network and that she would like to see, to send him the jokes on videotape and have him look at the tape and see if the jokes would be helpful in cheering up the audience up live with Regis. And Michael Gellman said, said, sure, send the tape. He would look at it and see if it would be good for the show. Uh, Glendora sent the tape. She called to see what the answer was. Michael Gellman never came to the phone. She never talked to him again. In five years, she never talked to him again. Uh, the two file boxes with 120 audio tapes showing this were on the floor of the courtroom between Franklin and Glendora. Glendora said that she found out from Calvin Norman, her salesman at WABC-TV, through Glendora TV ads, that Gelman had seen the tape, liked it, but it did not fit the format of live. Glendora then asked for the tape to be returned. It never was. She called every week about it. Finally, it was clear to her that Gelman had lost the tape. Then she started making a demand every week for $120 for the lost tape. She made the demand for five years, and Gelman never paid her. She also pointed out that she had sent the tape to Phil Buth, a friend for years of Glendora, and also a friend for years of Thomas Murphy, the owner of Cap City's ABC TV. Phil saw the tape, he liked it, but he had no authority to put the jokes on Good Morning America and replace, uh, what's her name? Irma Bombeck. It was a VHS just like the one that Glendora sent Gelman. In fact, he returned two of them. Phil Buth returned two of them. And Glendora told the judge how Michael Katz, predecessor of Michael Gelman, had been sent a tape like the one sent to Gelman, that he saw it, that he liked it, but he could not use it in his format at Arts and Entertainment, cable TV network. Katz lost the tape. He admitted that he'd lost the tape and he said that, that it was UPS who lost the tape and that UPS would reimburse them. But Katz, unlike Gelman, had the ethics finally in the end. He never bothered with UPS in the end because UPS was taking, well, actually because arts and entertainment was negligence in 
uh, sending the information UPS needed to process the claim. So finally, uh, Michael Katz uh, sent the money himself. He wrote his own check for $120. What a difference between Michael Katz and Michael Gelman. Judge Evans asked DiGiulio to tell his side of it. DiGiulio said about 600 words. Uh, Glendora also told Judge Evans how December 1st, Bigelow, the first attorney on the case, had called and said to Glendora, we want to settle this and get rid of it. And Glendora was very interested, but she had three reply affidavits uh, to by December 2nd, the next day, and was right at the moment uh, under the gun to get into the uh, these three reply affidavits. Plus, there was one that had to go to the uh, Westchester Supreme Court. And at the moment uh, when uh, Bigelow called, Glendora was videotaping her program, and her mind was someplace else. But Glendora would call Bigelow on Friday. Glendora said she wanted to settle it too and wanted to know what the release would be like. Uh, as it was, I never uh, could call uh, Bigelow because of getting, having to get these papers in, and I couldn't do anything until I got them all in, and that was on by Sunday night. And by Monday morning, December 5th, which was the day of the next court appearance, uh, the first thing I did was call Bigelow, and I called several times, but she never called back. The Julio called back, and I don't like that. I don't know Julio, and I don't like changing lawyers in the middle of the stream. You should stay with a lawyer you start out with, just as you should stay with the judge that you start out with. That's called the individual assignment system. Well, then Judge Evans explored with DiGiulio the possibility of settling it. DiGiulio was not interested in settling it. He never did show good faith about settling it. He wants the fees. He's what you call a fee sucker. Vandora said the release DiGiulio talked about December 5th over the phone was medieval, that no person in the 20th century would sign such a release. And Glendora said she had never been shown a copy of the release, that she had seen Judge Gantz look at it uh, at the bench, and that Judge Gantz looked straight at DiGiulio and said, no hereafter. Take out the hereafter. Judge Evans brought up the point that the lease was too broad, that it was not limited to the action herein, and of course, the Julio wanted a lease for all time, everything before, everything after. He wanted uh, ABC released and Cap Cities released, but ABC and Cap Cities, I didn't sue them. They were not parties to the action. I sued Michael Gelman. Uh, the Julio said it was a standard Blumberg form release, and Judge Evans was very enlightened, and she said, quote, unquote, I cannot make her sign a release that covers anything more than this action. It would be unconstitutional. Hooray for Judge Evans. But uh, Judge Evans said, in effect, so much for settlement, he, she could see that the Julio wanted to go uh, the whole gamut. And we all know why. There's more fees. He gets paid more. He's making a mountain out of a molehill. That's what it is. You know, and as I said to you long ago, Gelman should have shown up that first night, or he should have, when he got the summons, he should have just paid up. And then he should have shown up that first night, November 1st, and settled the whole thing then. I do not like the ethics and the standards and the lying and the stealing and the cheating of Michael Gelman. So Judge Evans gave up on the settlement. I want to insert here that the, jo the Yonkers Court really has a good system in small claims court for settling. First they call in the plaintiff and have the plaintiff tell his story alone without the defendant there. And then uh, the Yonkers Court says, urges the plaintiff to settle, you know, after all, a trial is a roll of the dice, which it is. There's nothing definite about a trial, never. It's a roll of the dice. And uh, then the plaintiff goes out and the defendant comes in and the judge talks to the defendant. And I don't know what the judge says to the defendant, but has the defendant probably tell his story and probably tries to get the defendant to settle. And then the defendant goes out and the 
two of them are asked to come in together, the plaintiff and the defendant, and then the judge tries to get the defendant and the plaintiff to settle. It's a pretty good system. And all I will add to that, what Judge uh, Kelman of the White Plains Court always says, uh, he says that if you have a settlement, your chances of getting paid are like 80% better than if you uh, have a judgment. So I just want to insert that. I think they have a very good system of uh, trying to settle small claims cases. And they have a high rate of settlement and a high rate of resolution of disputes. OK, there's a lot of typos in this report. Uh, and that's because it's hard to think and type at the same time. And Franklin isn't here so that he can type it. So I have to think and type at the same time. And that results in a lot of typos. So Judge Evans had Glendora swear in and give her name and address for the record. The court stenographer started her minutes. Glendora told the uh, repeated chronology. Judge Evan, uh, Evan, Evans had a very engaging smile. Glendora wanted to present her case by playing the audio tape she had been screening, logging, and queuing up five hours a day for two months. And Judge Evans would not let Glendora play the audio tapes on the basis that they were hearsay, that the person in the audio tapes wasn't here to testify. And that was, I took exception to that ruling, of course. That was my evidence. That was my case. That was a clincher. So I was pretty upset with that. And she knew when I said I take exception to that ruling that I was covering myself for an appeal to the appellate term, first department. Or no, I don't, it's not first department. It's something, something. Anyway, it is in the ninth and 10th judicial districts. I don't have any experience down there. It was not right. It was Glendora's case, and this was her evidence. Uh, it was not due process. So I was really upset by that. And Glendora wanted Judge Evans to look at her log, where she has the log way back to 1989 and 1990, uh, all the things that happened in the log which I've read to you uh, for five years. And that was my evidence. And uh, Judge Evans denied that. And I took, I said, I take exception to that ruling. And she knew what I meant. Uh, I really think that it was pragmatic more than uh, law or hearsay or anything else because she didn't have time to hear the tapes and she didn't have time to go through the law. However, that is my case. And I was denied presenting my case. Uh, these two, denial, two denials were big uh, blows to Glendora and to Franklin, uh, who had worked 400 hours preparing her case and was denied the chance to do so. Now to the court that she had increased her demand from $190 to $380 because Gelman had lost two of her tapes. Uh, this fact of the two tapes had come out in the affidavits of Gelman and Calvin Norman and Glendora's account executive at WABC TV uh, in the audio tapes and also in the audio tapes that Glendora had been screening for two months. Uh, Judge Evans opposed this. Uh, Glendora said she had submitted her notice to increase. And uh, DeGiulio, Glendora believes, said he had not got a copy of it. And Glendora protested that she had sent it to everybody, to Julio and Bigelow and uh, Thomas Murphy, the owner of ABC Cap Cities, and to Warren Buffett, the owner of almost 5% of ABC Cap Cities, and to the chief counsel at ABC Cap Cities, and to Michael Gelman. of it, and Glendora protested that she had sent it to everybody, to Julio and Bigelow and uh, 
Thomas Murphy, the owner of ABC Cap Cities, and to Warren Buffett, the owner of almost 5% of ABC Cap Cities, and to the chief counsel at ABC Cap Cities, and to Michael Gelman, and at that point, uh, DiGiulio uh, dug out the notice that said Glendora was increasing her claim to $380. And uh, did you, I mean, Judge Evans looked at it, and she said to Julio, when did you receive it? And did Julio said when he did. It, well, I sent it out with my cross motion, uh, no, with my reply affidavit to his cross motion, summary judgment. Uh, and Judge Evans said uh, that she certainly did have the discretion to increase uh, the uh, amount. And Glendora said that in small claims before, she had seen that done at the trial, increase the amount. And finally, poor Judge Evans said, uh, in the interest of getting this over with tonight, that she would grant the increase. So I won on that. $380, I won increasing my claim to $380. So that was two victories for Glendora, uh, that the release was unconstitutional and that uh, the uh, claim was increased. There's a special word for that, it begins with A. Uh, that the release was increased, uh, that the uh, claim was increased to $380. And insert, earlier Glendora told Judge Evans that there had been motions and that 11 motions and cross motions had been denied by Judge Schaefer and Judge Evans said, so we start out with a clean slate, I guess. Uh, Judge Evans did not seem to have the file. She seemed to have only a paper, a half sheet. <laughs> and I don't know if this, this is so, but I don't see how it could be so, but I just got that impression. This time, Glendora asked to see the paper that Judge Evans was looking at, the notice to increase the claim that DiGiulio had given her. Uh, and I should have done that uh, the time that uh, DiGiulio had given Judge Gantz a release to look at. I should have said, let me see that paper. Because after all, both sides have to see what goes to the judge. Uh, DiGiulio was in his usual bad temper. He was really awkward. His tactics really did not fit the procedure of small claims. His cross-examination of Glendora was heavy like a piano instead of light like a flute. His questions were prolix and convoluted. Glendora had to compart them and take them one section at a time. He made statements sometimes instead of questions, and the questions were way too long. One was about how easy it is to make a duplication of a tape. Uh, Glendora also told the court in the first run through that DiGiulio had wanted the release to include ABC and Cap Cities. Glendora said she had not made them parties to the action, that the only party to the action uh, was Michael Gelman. And this is Ginny Cat, heavy, heavy Ginny Cat, who is all belly. That's good, Ginny. You sit on the papers and you block the light. Uh, the Judge Evans agreed with this, and DiGiulio said, I have to protect my clients, and question that no matter how, how they lie or how they steal uh, or how they cheat, DiGiulio has to protect them. Question, why did Michael, what DiGiulio was really saying, I have to receive checks from my clients. Uh, why did uh, Michael Gelman wait until the Friday before the first court appearance, November 1st, to retain counsel? Can anybody figure that out? He had the summons was served on him September 20th, and he waited until uh, the Friday before November 1st, which was a Monday, to uh, retain counsel. Tell me, why? Michael Gelman really stacks up to be a great person, doesn't he? Back to DiGiulio's cross-examination of Glendora. He fell into the pit most lawyers do when asking Glendora about her TV shows. He asked if she broadcast discussions of her lawsuits on TV. I got disgusted with him. Instead of clearing up his language, I said no. She gave him because I don't broadcast, okay, and I don't uh, have discussions. Uh, she gave him another chance to rephrase his question accurately. He fluffed twice. Finally, Glendora said to him straight, it's not broadcast, it's cable cast. It is annoying enough to have lawyers so pro se about TV, but it is exasperating in DiGiulio's case when here he is representing a broadcast client. Uh, 
ABC, Cap Cities. Glendora also said there were no discussions, that she was the only one on the program, that they were reports. DeGiulio was not fully aware of the facts and circumstances and never has been, neither is Galman. He asked Glendora if she were employed and Glendora said no. He should know that Glendora is self-employed through Glendora TV ads. The worst thing uh, he did was try to make the judge swallow that Glendora brought the lawsuit against Gelman to have more material for her TV program. I hit the ceiling. Glendora said that's a lie. Glendora explained that she did not want her program to be about lawbreakers and about lawyers in courts, about the bad things people do. Glendora wanted her program to be about the good things people do, and it always was, up until these lawbreakers started doing just that, breaking the law. It had a feature Careers Unlimited to tell children how to get into certain fields and succeed. For instance, Robert Wright, CEO of NBC, did that. Okay, Jenny. Uh, this lie about filing lawsuits to get material for her show was a scandalous nadir. It was a desperation for Gelman and the Julio because Gelman has no defense and for not returning the Glendora's videotapes, two of them. Life is easy when a cat sits on your work. Okay, let's put this over in the pile that we've read the people. Now, that's it. Chew the papers, put holes in them. Glendora cannot wait for these lawbreakers uh, to be brought to justice so she can go back to telling about the good things people do instead of about the bad things people do. But our programs are helping people. She got so many telephone calls from people about them. Glendora protested to Julio's distortions with vehemence. Uh, the poor court stenographer had to stop the exchange three times because a court stenographer cannot write down simultaneously what two people are saying. The unknown woman who answered the telephone calls, uh, the, excuse me, the calendar call, uh, sat in the courtroom throughout. Franklin sat behind Glendora to her left. He was at a, it was a chummy court room kind of nice and conducive to small claims. Judge Evans had a very appealing way at the bench. She kept the order and kept it flowing. She spoke very softly. Uh, when the calendar clerk looked at the door, when the calendar clerk looked in the door and the New York State Court officer we have seen there so many times looked in the door, Judge Evans said, we are almost through. Oh, that was news to me. I didn't know I was almost through. Insert. Uh, in the uh, courtroom, the great big courtroom, 107, there was a little boy. He was about this tall. I say he's about five years old. And he belonged apparently to one of the New York State court officers. Uh, I don't think that's right. I don't think it's good for the little boy, and I don't think it's good for the court. He shouldn't have been there. But he was awfully cute. And he sat there, and he was fascinated by the computer. And he was putting in numbers and looking up at the screen and putting in numbers and looking at the screen. That was very cute. I hope he didn't ruin any of the data in the computer. Glendora called Franklin as a witness. Glendora was worried about Franklin. He didn't look good. He was flush. He uh, didn't take off his uh, raincoat all the time he was in the courtroom. Uh, he was very annoyed by DeGiulio's posturing and lies and crookedness. He even broke down at one point, Franklin did, and shivered and shouted. He was, of course, very upset by the denial of the audio tapes to be heard, and he was very upset by the log uh, denying to be heard. Uh, it bothered him when he was giving testimony that he was gagged, that he couldn't, wasn't allowed to say what he had to say to contribute to the facts. DeGiulio accused of Franklin of hearsay when Franklin said he'd heard the conversation with Gelman Christmas Day, 1989. Franklin was properly annoyed and said loudly, it was a speakerphone. And you know, Franklin's not like that. Franklin's very soft-spoken and very gentlemanly. Glendora forgot to ask Franklin if it were recorded, and Franklin was there when it was recorded. Glendora told the court that we had screened 676 audio tapes for two months, seven hours a day. Each tape was one and a half hours long. And 
we were nonplus why we could not find that conversation Christmas 1989, Lundor and Gelman, that Franklin witnessed. I just, you know, I couldn't believe that we couldn't find it. And we certainly went through those tapes, every second of them, up as far as uh, audio tapes 370. And then we started going through the tapes by the index. Uh, but at that point, there were no 1989 conversations or 1990 or 1991. They were all 1992, 1993, 1994, 1995. So it's a great blow to us that we couldn't find that uh, Christmas conversation with Gelman in 1989. We both know it was recorded. Apparently, it got erased. OK, that really was a bad blow. It's devastating. We feel very badly about that. It is the clear recollection of both of us that we had it on audio tape. Did Julio ask for a copy of a receipt or check that we paid $120 for the Gelman tub? But that is a misrepresentation, a distortion. First, Glendora had to go out and do the program in front of a live audience, the Eastern Star and Harrison. Then it had to be edited down to 10 minutes because the live program was 30 minutes. Then a master had to be made, and then dubs of the master had to be made. It was a work project. It was an art project. The value of that tape to Glendora was $120. At that time, uh, Glendora pointed out to the court uh, that was a very cheap price, that WABC TV at that time was charging $500 for a dub. Glendora also pointed out to the court that she had several tapes to play the court where she asked people if they wanted a dub of their interview on a chat with Glendora for $120. $120 was her price. That is what she got for VHS in those days. Today, she would charge $200. And I, at that time, ABC TV was charging Glendora $500 for a dub. Well, that's as far as I had chance uh, to write this log for you. Uh, and now I've got to go type some more and come back and read it to you but I was interrupted by 26 hours it took to answer Kalaji's motion to dismiss my uh, complaint of December 6, 1993 in Glendora versus Cablevision for censoring my program. Uh, the case, the decision of Judge Bryant that was vacated by the United States Court of Appeals and remanded. And that case is up and rolling very, very fast and very hard. So 26 hours, I had to do that. And then I had to uh, protest Judge Wood being bossed around by a lawyer named John Cousins and uh, about changing his decision. Cousins told him to vacate his decision, and Judge Wood does everything that Cousins tells him to do. And so I had to protest that to Judge Trafficanti, Judge Malonis, Judge Kay, Judge Ingracia. Uh, and then I had to finish uh, Glendora versus Cablevision, Charles Dolan, this is. It's really properly called Glendora versus Charles Dolan et al. Uh, Cablevision Lawsuit 3. I had to send my uh, Informa Papyrus and my, writ, my petition for writ of certiari to the Supreme Court of the United States. So the Gelman stuff, the last I worked on Gelman was Saturday, but I did. When I, even though I couldn't get my video, my audio tapes queued up, I got 77 out of 120. You know, when you start out to do a job, you still got to finish it, even though it's too late. Oh, see that sunshine. Oh, the weather's been so beautiful. 40 degrees. It's just been beautiful. We've only had two bad storms this whole winter. That was February 4th. 10 inches of snow when the pine tree lost its life. And, uh, the cold that came, eight degrees. That's the only two bad storms we've had. Other than that, the weather's been perfect since August. Uh, so when you start a job, you gotta finish it, whether it's too late or not. So all day Friday, and I mean all day Friday, from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., I queued up and logged uh, the rest of the Gelman audio tapes, 120 of them, so that here is the contents of the tapes.
uh, and I'm going to videotape those audio tapes for you so you can hear the record. I couldn't play it in court, so I'm going to have you hear it. Uh, so what would that be from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m.? Maybe 13 hours, wouldn't it? All day Friday, February the 24th. And then all day and about six hours Saturday, I typed this for you. So as I say, the time on Gelman's about $550 and the costs are about $85. And so now let me go to the typewriter and finish typing out this report. Okay, folks, it's uh, four hours later. Uh, that was uh, at 8.15, and now it's 12.15, and I finished writing what happened uh, in the Judge Evans court on February the 23rd, 1993, Glendora versus Michael Gelman at the trial. And the trial went, it, it, we were in court from about 6.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. But we must stop for some jokes. Uh, Paul says that his dog plays poker, and Jonathan says, really? And Paul says, yes, but he's not very good at it, my dog. When he plays poker, he gets a good hand and his tail wags. And uh, Peter says uh, that he is an inventor and that he has just invented, he's just crossed an electric blanket with a toaster, an electric blanket with a toaster so that people will pop out of bed in the morning. And uh, Johnny rode home from college to his father. He says, Dad, I went to the drama club. And he says, they gave me a part. And he says, I'm playing the part of a man who's been married for 30 years. And his daddy wrote back and says, good, son. He says, on your next play, I hope that you get a speaking part. And now <laughs> we will continue. This is the part I read you. Two sides, and here's where I resume typing. I read you that side, and this is page 400, and uh, 42 of the Gelman log, Glendora versus Michael Gelman. Uh, Glendora, so, Glendora also pointed out to the court that she had several tapes to play the court where she asked people if they wanted a dub of their interview on a chat with Glendora for $120. $120 was her price. That is what she got for a VHS in those days. Today, she would charge $200. At that time, WABC TV was charging $500 for a dub. And to DeGiulio's and Gelman saying how easy it is to make a dub, why was ABC ripping people off charging $500? You know, did Julia made a big point how easy it is to uh, make a duplicate, duplicate, he called it. It's a dub. And Galman was saying, you push this button, you push that. It was so silly. And so if it was so simple, how, how come uh, WABC TV was ripping people off charging $500 for a dub? Glendora won on chattel, three-year statute of limitations. Uh, DiGiulio and Bigelow kept saying that this was uh, for recovery of chattel and the statute of limitations was three years, but they gave up on that entirely. It was never mentioned at the trial. So we won on that. Uh, DiGiulio tried to list Glendora's other lawsuits or other fights for rights. Glendora objected that that was irrelevant to the case at bar, and Judge, Evan, and Judge Evans stopped DiGiulio's laundry list immediately. DiGiulio got into Gelman's, it is not our policy to return unsolicited video.